I always think like, you know, CPS, Children's Protective Services, they probably didn't bring that curve around far enough to make it Children's Destructive Services because yeah. they have caused so much damage. But the public sometimes thinks that there is, they're a pretty good organization. I remember reading uh, Rudolph Giuliani one time and he's talking about in New York, you know, how we need to do something for Children's Protective Services. And I mean, he was a big guy, you know, he's tough on crime. so. You take his word for it, you say, oh, maybe we need to have Children's Protective Services. Then you encounter them. <laughs> well, and let me tell you something else, where we are now yes. today. Yes, okay. So today, it is, of course, a private industry. Right. And it is run by private money. Yeah. In Washington, D.C., there are 114 lobbyists under foster care. Wow. And they're all hiring public relations firms. Okay. Are you serious? I'm sure they are, because yeah. I just somebody just yeah. sent me an article from the New York Times, yeah. more children moved into adoption. Like it's a... Like it's a wonderful thing. <laughs> I know. Like it's a sell something we should be celebrating. I know. I know. Instead of saying more families have been, you know, reunited or helped or, yeah. you know, so, and you look at the thousands and thousands of dollars. Yeah. You know, poverty is a big thing. You it know, is. I use this example when I talk to people sometimes when I'm talking to just like normal folk that aren't dealing, don't appear to be dealing with it. And I said, let me tell you an example, one that I know happened for sure. Mm -hmm. I said, you have a, a family. They've got a husband, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever. They got yeah. three little kids, right. all preschool kids. Right. He's working, you know, paycheck to paycheck. They're living in a little apartment. Maybe he's doing construction. He loses his job. Right. And so now he's homeless. Right? right, can't pay the rent. So maybe he can go out, work a few day jobs, stay in a week to week hotel, mm -hmm. and but they're homeless. They're considered homeless by the state. That alone is enough to take their kids. So they take their three little kids, put them in a foster home, pay the foster parents instead of the parents themselves. <laughs> I know. Pay the foster parents. Yes. Fifteen hundred dollars per month per child. I know. I know. And then. They take these poor parents, even the mom who's been a stay-at-home mom because she's had three babies back to back, right. and order them to pay child support to the state. Right. And when they can't pay child support to the state, terminate their terminate parental, their parental rights. rights. Yes. Now the foster parent can adopt. The state gets a bonus check for the kids. The foster parents under the adoption entitlement money continue to get a monthly stipend right. for these children. Right. For the remainder of their minority, a lot of times with these foster kids, and I just found this out, I've been going through the DCS records, right. once they turn 18, they get a stipend for until they're about 21, 22 years old. Mm -hmm. I've been pulling the, the results off, and I have found all these foster kids, ex-foster kids listed on the DCS payroll, getting 380 to 420 a month, Mm -hmm. And till they're like 22, plus pays for their education. Right, right. <laughs> but this is nothing other than legalized kidnapping. Yeah. It is government sanctioned. Social engineering. It's it's all sorts of things. I mean, look at that. What they can take a person, they can take a child from a family, and say your identity is now changed. Your parents are now changed. You no longer have these parents. Mm -hmm. And. What bothers me, among many things, but as you mentioned, these parents that have their children taken away because of poverty are the people that are probably thinking, how am I going to do this with my kids? They're thinking about it day and night. They're, they're laboring. Um, maybe they're working two or three jobs. Maybe they don't have all of the college perks that other some, somebody right. else did. Right. And they're being punished for poverty mm -hmm. or for, in some instances, because they maybe aren't as... Uh, cultured or a smart or as uh, and I hate to use the term elite but you know they don't have that air about them but listen I've stood before the Tennessee Court of Appeals mm -hmm. and I have said poverty is a social issue it, it is, is social not issue. a reason to end somebody's right to parent their child yeah and they just like look at me like like you're nuts oh. and, you know and this is something I mean the United States of America um, and the and you know what I you know the family destruction industry. I've, I've got a friend who calls it the family shredding, family shredding industry. Um, you know what they what they do to the parent child relationship, and you know we're gonna somehow make these kids better. But when you look at the kids, what kind of trauma do they go through? Mm -hmm. Well, and detachment. And detachment. Yes. You know, I, I mean you are and and reactive attachment disorder is is now like 
one of the big things yeah. that they're following with children who become sociopaths. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And <clears throat> when you break that bond, yeah. that family bond, you are creating detachment disorder. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you're taking away empathy. Yes. You're taking away loyalty, trust. Right. Um, just that whole, I mean, anthropologically, mm -hmm. it's destruction of society. Right. You know, it's last week we had, uh, maybe it was earlier this, well, well, within the last week, we had some testimony down at our Senate in mm -hmm. Texas, and they were talking about um, safety for schools for, for shooters, for shooting incidents. Mm -hmm. And two of my friends were down there, they were testifying, 26 out of the last 27 school shooters, what did they have in common? They came from fatherless homes. The detachment that you're talking about. And somehow, I mean, it's not just with CPS, but it's also with the whole divorce industry. Yeah. Um, because you mentioned that you used to work for divorce reform, so you, I'm, sh I'm sure you've seen some of the disastrous things mm -hmm. that um, the courts will do. Quote, in the best interest of the children, as oh, they're yeah. destroying the children. Oh, yeah. 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 They, and they have no concept. I'll just tell you, you know, and I've, I've worked in divorce courts now for 25 years, and I tell people, I say, judges, bless their hearts, they're lawyers, okay? They are lawyers, yeah. They're not psychologists. No, they are not. They're not medical people. <laughs> yes, yeah. You know? And then they're going to say, all the time, they're making the decisions based upon what they think. Exactly. It's I mean, a, I've heard him say it from the bench. We're like, well, I didn't do that with my daughter. I'm like, what? You know, yeah. I'm like, yeah. no, yeah. that is not your choice. No, it's not your choice. And I mean, at best interest means family integrity. And so many times I have to remind people yeah. that children have a constitutional right mm -hmm. to family integrity. Under the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution, it's not just parental rights. It is the right to fam familial association and familial integrity. Yeah. yeah. It is just, and I, and I want to add a couple more things. You asked what got me into it. As I started seeing this, these things unfold, uh, unfold and, mm -hmm. and what was happening, you know, I thought back to my own childhood. Right. And I said, in today's world, I would have been taken away from my mom. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. there was, I had an alcoholic stepfather, my right. mom struggled through that time period, right. and I could have very easily been taken from my mom. Right. And, you know, my mom, who ended up, you know, she she was amazing. I mean, she ended up being a restaurant owner, and, right. you know, very, you know, always very responsible, and, you right. know, she's the love of my life. I mean, I am her incarnate, mm -hmm. you know, reincarnated, but... Um, you know, what I, when I saw that and I thought, oh my gosh, in, t in today's world that would happen to me and how that would have been the end of my life. I just, yeah. I can't imagine going back as a child and going through those traumatic times and, and eliminating the most important person in my life. Yes. You know? Yeah. No, I know, I know, I know what you're, and the, um, so you mentioned the best, we were talking a little bit about the so-called best interest of the child, which is an opinion, mm -hmm. and two judges may have two different opinions on the best interest of the child, but it's basically the one who's wearing the belt black robe, <laughs> who's sitting in front of you, who somehow has this, this gem of wisdom. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, does he even know the children's names? Does he know no. the middle children's names? Has he been there to see what the idiosyncrasies are? What they, you know, Somehow this becomes the standard. And what I've looked at in our Texas Family Code, our Texas Family Code is about 1,525 pages. Mm -hmm. it, the idea of the best interest of the children is referenced either directly or indirectly at least 140 times from mm -hmm. what I've counted. And yet there's one thing that is never, there's two things. Number one, it's never defined. Right. So nobody knows what the best interest of the child is. It's this opinion. Right. It's what one person might think. It has nothing to do with family integrity. Mm -mm. And, and the second thing is everybody knows the best interest of the children except the parents. Yes. The, exactly. judge, the judge, the attorney, the social worker, the guardian, but the parents who've been there when the child's been sick at the birth, mm -hmm. all of this, somehow they don't know the best interest of the children. Yeah. And that is the part that just gets me. Oh, I know. And, I, know. Uh, I mean, so you, looking back at your life, to say that, you know, if had you been born today, or it been a child back in, you know, this day and age, the judge could say, I deem it to be in the best interest of your, chi of your child to your child. Yeah. It's like, your you. child saw that violence in your home. It's so dangerous. Yeah. You know, to be gone. So, yeah. 
you know, and then I'll add one other thing. So uh, I, my children, I love my children. I have three adopted children from Russia, and um, two of my girls, my twin girls, were very high maintenance uh -huh. as young teenage girls, and you know they did the runaway stints or whatever. And, yeah. And one of them, um, I really struggled with how to handle it, and I, we ended up in juvenile court. Right. And this juvenile court judge threatened to take my kids away from me. Like all three of them. She like ordered me. I had to bring all three of them in to be interviewed. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I was, you know, first of all, I was in a complete panic. But I thought, you are freaking crazy. Right. You know, now she didn't get away with it. Right. But she certainly was going to try to do that based upon the fact that I had a, you know, child who was run, a runaway. And, oh, I wouldn't take her to anger management classes. I'm like, she, it doesn't, it's not an anger management issue. Right. Okay. Right. We, we don't have anger issues. Yeah. She's just... You know, she ran away with a boy she met online. And, yeah. You know, so, you know, and then, she, oh, I had to remove all the computers from my house. And so she sent somebody over to my house to ins search my house and inspect my house. And I wouldn't let him pass the first room, which is where the computer typically was. And, of course, there was no computer that, well, we got to search the rest of your house. You may have moved the computer. I'm like, you ain't doing it. You're not yeah. doing it. Yeah. So I'm like, but, I mean, that's how I, I can see for myself. Yeah.